Um, just for starting out, I call these presentations unusual canopy emergency procedures because these are unusual situations. These aren't your just your normal look, grab, look, grab, arch, pull, pull, check. These are situations where you're going to have to do a whole bunch of other things, even if you get to pull handles or even if you end up pulling both handles or no handles at all. So these aren't real, real clear for most jumpers. So I'm, I've created this compilation of techniques and options to kind of address these because these are some of the most life-threatening situations a Ram Air parachute can face. Also, my disclaimer is, hey, these are my best world uh, recommendations um, through a whole bunch of experience and a whole bunch of, of witnessing a lot of accidents and other, other injuries. Um, so everything I'm telling you here is my best way to deal with it. But because no two situations are identical, um, you may do everything right and you could still be killed in one of these situations. All right, so my sources for this information was, one, I pulled up the U.S. Army, did a study on dual deployments back in the early 90s when they added Ram Air Reserve parachutes to the military. That study was extremely detailed, and I got a lot of really great information from it. Then the parachute industry made a, a malfunction video back in the 90s called Breakaway. And it was a bunch of part people in, Flor in Deland, Florida, uh, that worked for most of the manufacturers down there, that went up and they did every malfunction you could come up with, including entanglements and including dual deployments. And they landed them, they did everything. And uh, what was really interesting about that video, it was one of the best videos of all time, but also they did all those jumps without wearing a third parachute. Uh, I'm not quite that brave. Um, and then my witnessing of Ram Air parachute accidents for my whole life. Um, as you'll see in my bio, uh, I've been jumping for 45 years now. I made my first jump in 1978 when I turned 16. I've never been on current, and I got a little over 24,000 jumps now. Um, so I've saw a lot of people get hurt and killed. Um, I've had it personally was in, involved in a entanglement doing canopy formation where my reserve got pulled in the entanglement and I ended up having to land a main reserve entanglement. Because of that, I've been doing some form of this brief ever since that day. And that was a long time ago in the 90s. All right, so I put my bio up here. Um, obviously, I've got a lot of stuff for the military. Uh, for the last 23 years, I've been working uh, almost primarily for the military, but also doing a lot of demos and doing some sport jumping as well. Um, so you can see this is most of my military background. Uh, and then slide five, this is most of my USPA background. One of the things you'll notice that, you know, at the bottom of this is that I've been involved in a lot of entanglements. And that was because I was a canopy formation competitor for 20 years. Um, and so a lot of the information that I'm going to present to you, not necessarily, not necessarily for the dual deployments, but for the entanglements came from that. And then the last third, the last page of my bio, this is just all the stuff I did being a young jumper. Uh, both of my parents being professional skydivers owned a drop zone. I started working there when I was 10 as a uh, packer, packing T10s, round parachutes. And then when I turned 16, I started skydiving. Uh, I started hang gliding at 15, flew a, a powered aircraft at 17, or soloed an aircraft at 17. So anyway, that's kind of a little bit about who I am. You can look at all that other stuff if you want more detail. Starting the, the prep here, these subjects are often avoided or minimally addressed because they are rare and because they have infinite variables. The options and correct actions can be complicated and difficult to identify or discuss. A jumper can be paralyzed with too much information. In other words, they can actually do nothing because they're afraid to do the wrong thing. And believe it or not, people have been, jumpers have been killed and did nothing. They just rode whatever situation was to the ground because they were afraid to do the wrong thing and then absolutely, you know, did nothing. Um, and then the last part, very few instructors and jumpers have any personal experience to share. Because these things are rare, most jumpers have never had a dual deployment. If you maintain your equipment well and you pull at the right altitudes, you shouldn't ever have a dual deployment. Uh, right here, I've got a pair of canopies. This is a, uh, a PD-300 main 9-cell and a PD-283 
uh, reserve seven cell. I did a whole bunch of jumps in this uh, in this presentation where I flew and landed this can canopy combination. I also did several other combinations so th that I'll keep I'll show you as we get through them. The smallest one that I that I ended up landing was the one that happened to me years ago, which was a 143 reserve with a 150 main. What causes a dual deployment? In today's world, it's usually the AAD. And normally the AAD, it doesn't know if you pull low. If you go through activation altitude, the reserve's coming out, even if you've already thrown the main. So that's a pretty common one. For our military folk, setting the Cypress too high for the particular altitude that you're going to be pulling the main. This does happen in the military because we can set the Cypress to activate at any altitude, which would be advantageous if we're doing a hey-ho profile where we're going to fly the parachutes from 20,000 feet for a good 15 miles and we have a mountain to go over. So we want that Cypress to be high enough or if we have an area where we're exiting the aircraft that has a higher elevation, we want to make sure the Cypress is set high enough to prevent uh, impact with that elevation. So that's why for the military, an improper setting is also one of the more common causes. The next common cause would be a dislodged reserve ripcord pin due to movement in the aircraft or failure to inspect. For the military, we get lots of inspections, so it's not usually an issue with that. But young jumpers and military jumpers alike have a tendency to flop back on their reserve in the aircraft. Well, every time you lean back on that reserve container, you push the reserve pin just a little bit through the reserve flap. It is possible that leaning back enough times, you could end up pushing that reserve pin to where it's right on the edge of the loop. And as soon as your main starts to open, it pops the reserve as well. This has actually happened to a couple of my friends, so I know it's possible. The next one is something that happens typically um, to an, a young jumper or a new jumper, and that is um, a, a main riser rake of the reserve ripcord pin during an unstable deployment. So if I go out and I leave my hand out here when I reach for the pilot chute, at this moment I end up on my side, and then I throw the pilot chute. So now the air is going this way, so the riser on the low side has to sweep across the reserve as it's riding me. And so if I'm leaned into it just a little bit, that reserve, that riser can push the reserve pin out through the cover flap. I've actually saw it happen twice in free fall where a student did that. So I know it's a factor. I know it can happen. The more common situation is a pilot chute and tow. So anytime we're towing our main pilot chute, and it's not pulling that pin, either it's malfunction or there's something wrong with the routing or we have something weird going on. So then we go to cut away, pull the reserve. As soon as the reserve container opens, it relieves tension on that main container. And now the reserve starts and right behind it, the main starts coming out. Because that little bit that was holding it, it didn't take as much tension to release it because we have share in that common flap. We got reserve container up top, main container on the bottom, and that center flap they share. So when I relieve the tension on the top container, I also relieve the tension on the bottom container. I've seen more than 25 times where someone with a pilot chute and tow cut away, pulled the reserve, and ended up with both canopies out. Now, if I've already pulled that cutaway handle, that main should come out and keep going. Hopefully that by it not spending a lot of time up there, it has less time to become entangled. And then the last one that's pretty common, it would be a collision in free fall or during canopy flight. A collision in free fall would be enough to break the closing loops and get canopies to come out. A collision under canopy could be enough. Just the body impact could break a closing loop and get a reserve coming out. Or the lines of the other canopy could go under the reserve flap and actually cut the reserve closing loop. With today's containers, we have pretty good reserve protection that prevents a lot of that, and that line should just go right over the top. But if your tuck tab doesn't tuck very well, and sometimes it's sticking out, that line can come right under there and go right underneath and cut the loop. So those are the ways that are the most common causes of a, a dual deployment in today's skydiving world. 
This first video is me creating a dual deployment. And in this case, I did, I did four of these where I tried to get the main and reserve to come out at the exact same time to see how they would interact. You'll notice on this video, I am wearing a third parachute. I am not completely crazy. Not nearly as much as my wife thinks I am. So, as you watch these canopies come out, I'm trying to get them to come out at the same time. So as you see, the reserve gets a little head start right here, and then there goes the main. And I don't know if it happened so fast, did anybody see the main pass through the lines of the reserve? Let's look at it in slow, slower motion here. So you see, I'm gonna try to get both handles, try to get them both to come out at the same time. So I get, get that reserve ready, here we go. Throw and pull, reserve pilot chute goes, and there goes the main. And can you see the main ended up in front of the reserve? So if we look at these, uh, look at the reverse here, you can see it's pretty ugly. It's something you don't want to see. <laughs> That's why it's better you don't see it. And then if you look at the pictures here, you can see right there, it's pretty obvious that that main is now on the front side of that reserve. So it's passed from, from the back to the front. Um, also, if you look here, what, look what happens the first one-tenth of a second. Those bridles twist right up. And then here's the reserve going up first, hits the top, starts to spread, then the main follows it. And then right here, the reserve slider starts to inflate. The main pilot chute and bag hits that slider. Then it's got to go somewhere. It can either go out the back where it was supposed to go. It can go out the front as it did in these photos. Or it could go out the side. Or it could even go through one steering line. But this is the thing that most people don't understand that is so deadly about a dual deployment is that they end up passing through one another. And it might be difficult to identify that. So right there, very obvious that it's passed through. And then if you look at this last photo, here's the canopy. It's fallen down now. It's fallen down next to me. So I wouldn't have even known that the main had passed through the lines if I didn't look at the risers. So by looking at the risers, I could see the main risers were going around the reserve risers. However, because it was front to back or back to front in this case, the risers had some place to go. Either this way, this way, this way, or that way. Had it passed through the side, then you would not be able to get rid of the main parachute and you would be forced to land two canopies. Otherwise, it would be fatal. So, after all that happens behind you, you can end up with all of these situations. Both canopies deployed without any form of entanglement. Both canopies deployed with some form of entanglement. One or both canopies inflated and controllable. One or both canopies inflated and uncontrollable. Or you could have neither canopy inflated because they're still in the bag. If they're still in the bag, get one out of the bag now. Now, because it's an infinite number of things that could happen and an infinite uh, number of variables we could be dealing with, I broke it down into four configurations, four basic configurations that they're going to be in. And that's the four you see here, side by side, some form of a biplane, the dreaded downplane, or partially deployed, where we have one parachute open and one parachute partially deployed. common responses for all dual deployments. The number one most important thing if you have two parachutes deployed is to check for entanglement. This is critical. Most jumpers don't do this. So you have to inspect the risers and suspension lines and be 100% certain that no parachute has passed through the lines or risers of the other parachute. This is going to take a minimum of 20 seconds. For most people, it could take up to a minute, especially for the military jumpers who are jumping at night wearing NVGs. you got a lot to look for. Um, so you, in other words, you got to have time to make the inspection before you think about getting rid of the main parachute. One of the things we've got to look for is how are the risers crossing? So you got eight risers, Bob. Eight. I got eight risers I got to report to. All right, I got four going over here. I got four going over here. I might have some crossing right above my head. 
So I need to look at each riser and follow it and see where it goes. Make sure nothing has passed through anything. Make sure all of it makes sense. One of the most important things we're going to be looking for is how the risers are crossing. Especially if we have a canopy on each side, we're going to have risers right over our head right here with some going that way and some going that way. We need to make sure that they haven't passed through one another. All right, so looking at this photo here, we can see we've got the reserve over on the right and we've got the main over on the left. And then we have risers crossing right over your head. And typically, they're right here. You actually got to put your head back a little bit to see them. So that's one of the most critical things that we want to find is how are those risers crossing. As you can see in the picture, they're crossing like this and they're laying against one another. In other words, one parachute is laying against the other parachute. And that's what we want to see. That's a good sign. And if you look at this next picture, you can see, look how close together those risers are. Look how much they're compressed. They're definitely closer together than normal. And that's because normally we have the risers like this, but we have two sets now trying to work in that same space. And because of that, they're compressing against one another. The compressing against one another, like you see there, is definitely the best way. And that tells you that it looks like they're laying against and not passing through. If I see risers passing through risers like that, that would be a situation where I have to land both canopies. And then the last picture here shows that grip on the two canopies on a, on a side by side, which we're going to see a bunch more of the video here in just a second. So, as you can see, I'm gripping both of these risers here, as you can see in the, in the photo there. And then you put just a little bit of pressure on them. And the reason for that is we're trying to get the canopy on the right to turn slightly to the left towards the other canopy, trying to get the canopy on the left to turn slightly to the right. We don't need to remember rights and left, just push them together. And if you see this, you can see the grip there where I'm putting about two to three inches of pressure on each riser and just holding them so that the canopies stay together. When we're checking for these risers and we're looking to make sure that they're not passing through one another, any riser passing through any other riser is a reason to land two parachutes. Now, main risers going through reserve risers, if you cut that away, there's a small chance that they may leave and clear, but it's not a chance I would be willing to take because your chances of it snagging and making the reserve uncontrollable are very high. If you have the opposite, if you have reserve risers passing through main risers and you cut away, that's usually fatal because that's going to completely close the reserve 100% and you're going to be left with just one half a riser on one half of a main canopy. So it's extremely important that any risers passing through any other risers, you end up landing both canopies. Now, the other thing we've got to look for in the entanglement is the deployment devices. Obviously, the bag and pilot sheet on the main is going to be up there somewhere. It's going to be attached to the center of the main and hanging back down somewhere. The bag and pilot chute on the reserve is called a free bag because it's not attached to the reserve. This is one of the greatest inventions in skydiving of all time. The free bag has saved thousands of lives because what it allows is if the reserve pilot chute were to snag on something, the bag and the bridle can continue the deployment of the reserve, let the reserve go, and let the reserve open freely without being interfered by that horseshoe malfunction of the reserve pilot chute. So if you see the free bag up there in those two canopies, it's entangled with something. Otherwise, it's gone floating down all by itself. So what is it tied to? Is it tied to both canopies? Is it tied to just one canopy? That's something you have to check and make sure that the two canopies are not tied together with that free bag. All right. More common responses for all configurations. Number two, do not release the brakes on either canopy if you have not already done so. The reason is we want that canopy to fly slow. 
The brakes are probably still set on the reserve, so it's flying slow. And we want the two canopies to fly at the same speed. We don't want one to go dramatically faster than the other. Plus, it's much easier to manipulate those canopies on rear risers with the brakes set. Everything moves slower. Everything happens slower. It's much easier to control the parachutes. Plus, if we have to land them, you're coming down at half the descent rate, which is very manageable and very doable. So for that reason, we keep those brakes set. Now, what if we open our main low, main comes out, opens up, we release the brakes on the main, and then we realize our Cypress fired and our reserve pilot chute is coming out. Well, at that point, just go to half brakes on the main parachute, maintain half brakes so that you have the same brake setting as the other canopy, which is the reserve, set at half brakes. And then you're going to manipulate the main using a half brake position to match the reserve. We're going to start with the first and most common configuration, the side by side. All right, we got one over here, one over here, hopefully touching in the middle directly above our head. So anytime we have a dual deployment, we want to get rid of the main parachute if we can. It's just safer and, and less complicated. So if we're above a thousand feet and we're 100% certain that the canopies are not entangled in any way, and we know that if we pull that cutaway handle, that reserve, those main risers have somewhere to go, then let's get rid of the, that main parachute. And the best way to do that is what we call left on left of the left. So I'm going to turn my back to you for a moment. So I'm going to take the rear riser of the left canopy, left hand, left rear riser on the left canopy, left on left of the left, right hand on the cutaway pillow, peel the Velcro. Then bring that riser in, cause the canopy on the left to separate, get at least one half canopy's width of separation, and then cut away and let go. We didn't choose main or reserve canopy. We just chose the canopy on the left. So once we've pulled that off, we cut away, let go, and make sure you let go, because if you hold on to that riser, it can actually pull your, your shoulder apart. If that happens to be the reserve, you don't want to keep turning all the way around and flying into the main parachute that you just got rid of. All right, so here we are, uh, flying along, fat, dumb, and happy. Here comes the reserve. So you see it coming out, watch the free bag. Free bag comes right off. And then look how slow that reserve inflates. It takes a little bit of time because the main is at half brakes right now. I haven't released the brakes yet, and it's going pretty slow. And you can see as that happened, I'm gonna go to the next video here. Here's your point of view, and here comes that reserve. And you notice I didn't manipulate the canopies in any way, and they brought themselves together into the side-by-side. -side. That tells me that one, there's no defect with any canopy. That means they're both wanting to fly straight. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're not entangled, but it's usually a pretty good sign if they go right into a, a really nice side-by-side. -side. And so you can kind of just get some visuals here of what the parachutes look like flying like that. So this next video is just me separating the canopies using left on left of the left. Uh, this canopy combination, this is uh, the military javelin with a 360 main and a 375 reserve. Obviously the reserve's on the left in this case, so I'm gonna go ahead and separate using the left. Here we go, separate, 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 about right there, that's plenty of separation. Cut away, let go. All right, so in this video, so I've got the reserve open. I'm going to go ahead and throw the main out. Main comes out, and as you can see, as it starts to deploy, it starts line twisting. And then I do everything wrong from this point, and I do not get it to, to untwist. And so now it flies into the reserve, bangs into that, dives off to the left, and now I'm in some form of a downplane here because of these line twists. So I'm reaching and pulling on different risers here. I try to bring the main over to the reserve, but the reserve runs away. So now I'm gonna go ahead and, all right, so now I'm gonna shift my weight a little bit to try to bring the reserve back, which it does start helping. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get the risers. So you can see I reach above the twist here on the left, grab that one on the right, and now I can hold them together. I can pull them apart, 
I can hold them together and I can steer them. So that's how you control it, even if you've got the line twist. So you can see because of the twist, it didn't want to stay in the side by side. It wants me to keep it wants me to keep them together. So here I'm gonna go ahead and do left on left to the left, separate, cut away, let go. With this dual deployment, this is a great one. Uh, this is a military guy out of Paris Valley, um, U.S. Navy SEAL, and has a dual deployment on a training jump. They do a lot of training out there. And uh, what I really like about this video is how much time this guy takes to make sure they're not entangled, and he very carefully uh, separates and, and, and handles getting rid of it. So you see him here, the canopies are open. Instructor obviously is staying with him here. So he's checking it out, he's looking at things, he's like, oh man, what do I do here? And then they kind of go into a side-by-side -side right there. If you could keep them like that, great. And then they kind of start to separate a little bit here again too. So you can see he's just looking at it. But guess what he's got a lot of time on? He's got a lot of, a lot of time. He's got altitude, he's got time. Two big open canopies, make sure. You're closer to the ground, things have to happen a little quicker. So he's very confident that he can get rid of this main. He's got his uh, the left the risers in his left arm, right hand in his cutaway handle, got the Velcro peeled, and he's like, all right, it's time, cut away, let go. And he's clear, and now he can safely land that reserve. Remember, anytime we can land the reserve alone, land the reserve alone. Uh, we only land two if we have to. So following up with the with the side by side, what if the canopies are entangled? What if you're below a thousand feet where you don't have time to do a good inspection, separate, cut away, and find a place to land a reserve? Or what if you're just not sure? Because remember, we said we have to be 100% certain if we're going to get rid of that main. Anything less than 100% and we're taking a chance. So if we are in this situation, then we need to land both parachutes. Control them and land them together. Now, there's a couple ways we can do that. One is by using on the side by side, we've got both canopies like this. We have a super high aspect ratio wing. So this thing, the side by side wants to glide, right? So we're going to take the inside rear riser on this canopy, the inside rear riser on this canopy, and turn them both towards each other slightly just enough to keep tension on them. Because what we don't want is we don't want them doing this. We want them to stick together and stay together. And that way they're easier to control. Now, once I have them stuck together, I can steer this thing all the way to the ground. And all I have to do is always push the canopies together. So if I want to turn that way, I push the other canopy in that direction. Push in that direction. If I want to go that direction, I take this canopy on the far side and push in the direction I want to go. So we're always pushing the canopies together, never pulling them apart. And by doing this, we can fly this thing all the way to the, to the LZ, all the way to our primary landing spot, landing spot. We got a four to one glide ratio. This thing is going to outglide everybody else up there, unless you're on a Raider Intruder. And so just fly that landing pattern, come in, and then as you come in on final approach, keep them touching, don't let them separate. Do not try to flare either or both canopies. He'll just make them angry. So just keep them together, slide, run, or PLF. But the goal is to not let them separate. All right, so in this video, you can see that I've got the reserve canopy on the right side and the main canopy on the left. So anytime that you have, I'll hit play, and watch a play. Anytime I got the reserve over here and it's a seven cell and I've got a main that's a nine cell or a gl more gliding canopy, I found each time in all the combinations I jumped that it had a tendency to always drift to the direction of the seven cell. So whichever side the reserve was on, it had a natural tendency to go that side. If it was on the right, it had a right turn. If it was on the left, it had a left turn. As you can see in this video, with it on the right, it kept turning to the right. Now, by holding a little extra tension on the right side, I can make it fly straight. And then the next video here shows the MJ. This is the military javelin with the MS uh, military silhouette 360 and the TR 375. 
So big canopies, and I'm really slick here. You'll notice that the canopies don't necessarily aren't, the lines aren't the same length. So I've got the main with longer lines and the reserve against the side of it. And that's okay. That's okay. They'll still just push against those lines and hold them steady. Now I want you to watch how small a movement I make on this riser. I'm going to reach up, pull on the, uh, the inside riser of the canopy on the right, and watch how quickly it turns. It doesn't take hardly any at all here. There's the pull right there, and there's the turn. So it's actually very... Um, very responsive, even with big canopies. The smaller the canopies, the more responsive and the more radical things are. The bigger the canopies, the slower and more docile things are. So in this case, I'm just flying the MJ around and you can see it has a natural tendency to go left. So if I have the reserve on the left and the main on the right, I'm probably going to do a left hand pattern. If it's on the right, I'm going to do a right hand pattern, playing to its natural tendency to have a, a drift towards the reserve. So here I'm going to go ahead and land them. Now on this particular jump, I was coming into land and I felt really good about it, so I let off on the one on the right. And you'll see at the last second, it starts, the one on the right, the reserve, starts to separate a little bit right before I touch down. Um, so uh, for that reason, don't let up. Keep them together all the way to the surface. So I let up right there, and they started separating a little bit. Now, I did a PLF on, the, on all of these landings because that's what I recommend. It's an unusual situation. It should be an unusual landing. If you can run or slide or PLF, that's fine. Um, just protect yourself because it's not a normal landing. Here's that same landing. From, uh, from the ground camera, and watch, you'll see that reserve, it starts to separate right there, just a little bit. And I could have ran that out, but I decided to do a PLF. All right, so here's another one. Right after that jump, I'm landing the other direction, and I hold it all the way to the ground. And then here's the video of that landing, and you see a little separation right at the beginning there, and then they stick together all the way through, this, all the, way through the touchdown. And then I got one more for you. This is landing the military javelin. And so there was a great big log right in front of me where I was about to land there. So at the last second, I pushed it off to the right, slid right a little bit, avoided the big log, and had a nice soft touchdown. And you can see how the canopies, I'm just making them stay together. Don't let them get too far apart. So we covered the side-by-side. -side. The next more common, most common, would be the biplane. We got one canopy in front, one canopy behind. Looks something like that from the side or from behind. Um, very common, you can see why they would call it a biplane. Like two wings right over on top of each other. All right, if you're above a thousand feet, you're a hundred percent certain they're not entangled, get rid of the main. The way we do it, very similar to the side-by-side. -side. Left hand, left rear riser of the rear left on left of the rear, right hand on the cutaway handle. Pull that riser down, cause the canopy in the back to dive off to the left, get at least one half canopy of separation, cut away, let go, and let it go. Um, make sure you get the, the canopy to go all the way over there, get them far enough apart. All you need is half a canopy, and you got plenty to get rid of it. All right, so here's a great picture of what it looks like having the main in front and the reserve in back. One of the most important things we have to look for with the biplane is where is the bag and pilot chute from the main. With the main in front, we want to make sure that the bag and pilot chute is up on top of the reserve and not down in the lines. In this photograph, you can see very clearly that there's no, no bag and pilot chute underneath in the lines of the reserve. You can actually see the shadow of the pilot chute on top of the reserve. So that is a good sign. That's what you want to see. Now, if we go to the video here, you'll notice we see that pilot chute dancing up on top up there. That's a good place for it. If that pilot chute is underneath the canopy in the back, the reserve, and it's in the lines of the reserve, we cannot move either canopy. If you try to separate those canopies with that pilot chute under there, 
it will collapse the main parachute into the reserve parachute and you won't have any good canopies left. So if that pilot chute is underneath, you're landing with two canopies. All right, here's a good example right here of left on left of the rear. Left hand on the rear, right hand on the cutaway pillow, pull, the, pull it down, here we go. And just look at that canopy in the back, separate, 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 cut away, let go. And you're clear. All right, so what if the canopies are entangled? You're below a thousand feet or you just aren't sure. Um, in this case, let's land the biplane. To land a biplane, we're gonna steer the front canopy using the rear risers on the front parachute. And what we want to do is put just a couple inches, couple inches of pressure on the rear risers so that the front canopy compresses against the rear canopy. We want the cells of the rear canopy to latch into and lock into the lines of the front canopy. That way it doesn't slide around. So if we slow that front one down just enough, we'll get a good lock between the two. Then we just steer the front canopy and the rear canopy will follow. Again, we do all of these very slow, very soft, because we don't want to do anything radical. If we like how they're flying, keep flying them that way. So all we're going to do is fly this down. Now remember, the side-by-side, -side, it wants to glide. It's had that four-to-one glide ratio. The biplane does not have a good glide ratio. The biplane is a one-to-one -one at best. And the reason is, look at the canopies. The front canopy is two nose down. The back canopy is two nose up. So neither canopy is in its happy place. So they still will land you very soft, very easy to control, but they have no forward speed. Why do you need to know this? Because if I have to land the biplane, I want to turn final right on top of the target because I'm not going to go very far. If there's more than 10 knots of wind with a biplane, you're probably going backwards. That's the most likely scenario. Again, uh, don't attempt to flare either or both canopies. You'll just make them angry. Keep them together. Keep them touching. PLF or slide. Right here is a great example of what it looks like to control the front canopy in the biplane. So I'll hit the play, here we go. So I'm gonna grab those two front rear risers on the front canopy, put a little bit of pressure on them, and then I could actually make that really soft turn. Now in this case, I was able to move the back canopy. Um, don't worry about that, you can do that if you want to. But because they weren't really entangled, I just moved that to, for better video. Um, the next video here, this guy, if you look at his altimeter, it's reading 1,800 feet. However, he's got his top brakes released on his main, and all of a sudden his reserve's about to come out right here. So he's just flying along, and uh-oh, here comes the reserve. And you notice how it went right up into a biplane. And that's typical of what happens if one canopy opens after the other one's been flying. It's also typical if the main is in front and the reserve is in the back. Because if the reserve is in the front and the main is in the back, it will always go to a side-by-side -side because of the longer lines on the main. So that first video showed him dealing with it. So he has two options here. He could either get rid of the main, separate and get rid of the main, or he can land the biplane. This guy chose to land the biplane. So if we watch his video here, you notice he's using the rear risers to control it. And he's keeping the canopies touching. He's not doing anything radical. So he's doing nice soft turns here, not letting that back canopy move around too much. Now the one thing he does is he does fly out over this power line. If I'm under two canopies, I'm not gonna be anywhere near any power lines. I'm going to keep, this is an unusual situation, so I'm going to land unusually far out in the field, away from any obstacles. He does a great job. We got a good shadow shot. That's one of the reasons I left this video all the way to the end, is he does a really nice job of videoing his own landing. And you notice how he's keeping that nice and mellow, not doing anything radical. And he actually, I'm not sure if he flares at the end. It looks like he does. Um, it didn't really make any difference. The parachutes landed the way they did. 
This dude didn't get the memo about the biplane not having a good glide ratio. So he's going to open low, his Cypress fires, his reserve comes out, and they go into the biplane. Now, when he first looks down, he's over a pretty good little open field. But he sees on the other side of the road a big open backyard. So he thinks he's going to glide right over the highway, right over the power lines, and go into that backyard. What he doesn't know is the biplane doesn't glide very far. So what he does here is he looks down. He's like, okay, I'm going to just go with the biplane. It doesn't look entangled. I would have got rid of the main if I could have, but he's okay. He's got it under control. So now he thinks he's going to that backyard. He still thinks he's going to that backyard. And now he's getting ready to cross that power line, and he's not quite getting the glide ratio he was hoping for. And about right here, if you look at it, you'll fly right into it. So look away, steer away. Quit looking at the, at the house. Quit looking at the chimney. And boom! All right. Well, he got kind of lucky. One canopy on one side of the roof, the other canopy on the other side of the roof. I guess that's the advantage of having two canopies. And he didn't roll off the roof. But obviously a great example of the biplane just doesn't go anywhere. Now we're going to talk about a little variation in the biplane, and that's the offset biplane. In other words, we could have the canopy in the back could be offset to the left, or it could be offset to the right. So let's talk about these because they do have a little quirk that comes with them. First of all, let's go with the easy one. If it's offset to the left, well, all we got to do is check for entanglement, and then we're going to go left hand on the left rear riser of the rear canopy, right hand on the cutaway pillow, separate, 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 cut away the main, land the reserve. Offset to the left, no big deal. Where it gets weird is when it's offset to the right. Because we need to move this canopy left so that our right hand is on the cutaway handle. So what we're going to do in this situation is bring it halfway to the middle and stop then go the rest of the way. Now you could separate this one and put it over here, but that wouldn't be the canopy in the rear. So to keep things consistent, let's just move the canopy in the back. And all we got to do is move it to the middle, stop, and then go the rest of the way and get rid of the main. Now the reason we have to stop in the middle is because I had several times when I was practicing this where I took the canopy from the right all the way to the left and when I went from all the way over here to all the way over here the right front of the of the canopy I was moving grabbed the steering line of the front canopy and turned it and that was a moment for me it's like aha when it was going really fast it built up speed and it had enough energy to move forward and pull on that steering line but when I went halfway and then the rest of the way it never did that so that's how you would deal with that, with the offset, if they're not entangled. All right, so in this video, I'm going to go ahead and hit play. That's just kind of a demonstration of what it looks like to be offset left. And then there's offset right. My cameraman was supposed to be behind me on this, so it doesn't show it so good. But what you can see right here in this part of the video is you can see how that front canopy is nose down and that back canopy is nose up. That's why it doesn't have a good glide ratio. Still lands fine, but doesn't glide very well. All right, so continuing with this offset biplane, here's the other weird quirk about it. So if, if they're entangled or we're low and we don't have time, and we're going to land it. If it's offset to the right, then I'm going to fly it like a biplane because it's still a biplane. So I'm going to steer the front canopy. But because it's sort of like a side-by-side, -side, I'm also going to treat it like in between. So I'm going to steer the front canopy, making all my turns towards the other canopy. So if it's offset to the right and I have to land it, I'm probably going to do a right hand landing pattern. I went a little too far there. <laughs> if it's offset to the left, I'm going to do a left hand landing pattern. So because it's sort of like a side by side and it's sort of like a biplane, 
I treat it. It's still a biplane, so I steer the front, but it's sort of like a side-by-side, -side, so I always steer towards the other canopy, never pulling them apart. Again, the airspeed is very slow, very low glide ratio. Just come in and land. Don't try to flare. Just do a PLF or slide or run. All right, the last category of dual deployments is the dreaded downplane. The one that scares everyone the most, as it should. You have one canopy going one direction, the other canopy going the other direction, and the result is a vertical descent towards the ground. Obviously, this could be fatal or could permanently injure you if you rode that all the way to the surface. One of the things we were wondering about is why do they sometimes downplane? Why do they sometimes biplane? Why do they sometimes side by side? And it was actually in a 1992 Army study, basically about using two ram air parachutes, that if either canopy had a slight defect that caused the slightest turn in either direction, the result was the 180 degrees apart downplane or somewhere close to it. Um, so a uh, line twist actually caused a turn, a broken line, a release break, uh, torn fabric, um, tension knots, all of those, the result is going to be a downplane instead of the biplane or the side by side. So, we've just figured out what we have and why we have it. Do we still have to check for entanglement? Absolutely. Just because they're downplaning doesn't mean that one didn't pass through the other one before it got to that position. In fact, that might even be part of the reason why they're downplaning is because something has passed through something else. So yes, we still have to check for entanglement. Look at the risers, look at how they're crossing, look at where they're going. Always ask yourself, if I'm going to get rid of the main parachute, which we want to do when we can, where are the main risers going to go? Do they have a clean path to leave the situation? So if we're above a thousand feet um, and we're a hundred percent certain the canopies are not entangled, then we'll go ahead and just release the main parachute and let it go and then ride the reserve. At that point, we, the reason we use a thousand feet is a thousand feet is a pretty realistic number so that you have time to separate the canopies or determine if they've been entangled, still have time to get rid of the main, get control of the reserve, and find a safe place to land. Because typically when this happens, um, if you're in that situation, you might not have a lot of time. So if you do, absolutely. Uh, the, but both canopies are one in front and one behind. Usually that's a pretty good sign that they're not entangled, but not 100%. If they're a little bit crooked to your body position or to your main lift webs, well, then that's usually a sign that maybe something has passed through something else. Um, so, but once we're 100% certain, release it, get control of the main of the reserve, and uh, land safely. So here he is. He's got his reserve open. And he's opening up this main with a bunch of line twists. The result is going to be the down plane. Don't pay too much attention to the jumper. Just look at the canopies. And you can see how he's trying to bring them together right here, but then he doesn't maintain it. So he determines at this point that they're not entangled, that he can release the main parachute without endangering the reserve. And so he go, goes ahead and does that right here. And you can see he has a clean release right onto the reserve canopy. All right, the next video here, we have an intentional downplane that was done for military testing. We have two 360 square foot nine cell canopies, reserve and main. The all up weight on this jumper was 450 pounds. The whole point of this test was to see how fast the downplane would hit the ground. So there's a bunch of sensors on this dummy. Um, we also released one brake on each side so that it wouldn't fly away. So here we go. So as you can see, it's spiraling a little bit and that's because we released each brake. But the, even with two 360 square foot canopies, they're building up a lot of speed. And this thing hits the ground at 60 miles per hour. It didn't look like 60 to me, but that's what the device said. So, and then the second one there was just a reserve making a low turn. Um, the biggest thing about the downplane is how it drives you straight into the ground. It doesn't allow you to roll the energy off in any direction. And for that reason, most people that ride a downplane end up with a lot of severe pelvis and lower body uh, injuries, as well as a lot of times people are paralyzed from that particular situation. All right, so what if you're in the downplane the canopies are some form of entanglement, or you find yourself below a thousand feet where you just don't have time for a good inspection, separation, and getting control of a reserve, 
um, or you're just not 100% certain. Because remember, if you're not 100% certain and there was an entanglement and you release that main parachute, there's a really good chance it's going to completely collapse your reserve with it. So, if you find yourself in this situation, what we have to do is take the vertical flight and create horizontal flight. And the way we do that is we take each of these canopies, the one in front and the one in back, and we take each one and we turn them towards each other on the same side. Could be off to the right, or depending on how you're situated in the harness, it may make more sense to do it off to the left. But either way, for that to be accomplished, what you have to do is, if I've got one in front, one in back, I'm going to reach up between the risers with this hand and grab the rear riser, which is on top in the back. Then I'm going to reach between the risers from the outside onto the rear riser, which is on the front canopy on top as well, and bring them in. And the closer, the more I make those canopies turn, the more they will end up above me until they touch. And when they touch, they are directly above you where you want them. Now, um, I was able to do this um, in a video you'll see in a moment. Um, and it took me eight seconds uh, to do it. So I know it's doable and I only lost 200 feet. Now, I was on really big canopies when I did it. Um, I was on military parachutes. Um, without a full load and of combat equipment. So it was light, lighter pressure on those risers. So because of that, I was able to pull those risers in and hold them and keep them together. Now, you may find yourself in this situation getting them together, but because of the entanglement or because of the condition of one canopy as opposed to the other canopy, you may have to keep them together. You may be in a continuous turn keeping them together. In which case, you're, what you're doing is you're preventing the vertical by keeping the horizontal, but in this situation you may not have uh, much control over which direction you end up landing, because you may be in a turn all the way to the ground. You also may not have much control over exactly where you land. Um, so that's another option, that's another thing you got to be aware of. Um, but what you are controlling is you're controlling your vertical rate of descent. You're not screaming at the ground. You're in a slow turn reaching the surface. Now, if for some reason you are unable to do this with those rear risers, the next easiest option is to do the same thing with the toggles from that same rear risers and bring both of those toggles down, which you'll be about halfway, you'll release the brakes on that side, and then you gotta bring them past halfway. The reason we gotta bring them past halfway is we need those brake settings to be deeper than the brake setting on the other side, which we still have that brake set at half brakes. So we gotta get them down past that to force those canopies to fly to that direction. Now, the reason I say this is another option is, one, those might be easier or might be accessible where the riser may not be, or the grip on the riser may be too slippery, whereas if you've got those handles, you know you can get them to your body, get them down to your hip, grab onto your harness if you have to for extra support, and hold onto those toggles, bring those canopies together, and then from there you could still steer that by pushing them in the direction you want them to go. Remember, with that side by side, we're always pushing the other canopy. We're pushing in the direction we want to go, never turning away, always pushing them together. All right, so that's our second way of creating a down plane into a side by side. The other two options we have are to create what's called, one uh, option three I would call this, would be to create a drag plane where we take the brakes on the canopy that's in front of us, that's, uh, uh, that we have access to the toggles, grab those toggles, bring them all the way down to your hips, again, bring them as deep as you can without stalling the parachute, and you cause the front canopy to slow down more than the back canopy. And then you can get those canopies to some form of an angle other than vertical. The slower you can get this canopy, the more underneath you can get this other canopy. And as it gets underneath you, in canopy formation we call this a drag plane, because we're kind of dragging this other canopy underneath. 
In canopy formation, once this canopy gets underneath here, it starts to lighten up and it starts to become easier to manage this one. So the slower we make this one go, the easier it is to manage the one below. Now, the last option is if whatever I can't do, I cannot get these things to come together, I could try to pull one in. Whichever one seems to make the most sense to pull in, grab one of the toggles and just start reeling in steering line. Reeling it in, no matter how hard it is to pull, keep reeling, keep reeling. Get fabric in your hand. The very back corner, back one of those two back corners of that parachute, and then start rolling that fabric into your arms. Reeling it up and reeling it up. Bringing that drag away so that you can move back underneath your wing. And now you can control that wing. First of all, control the fabric. Use your harness to steer. Maybe get an arm out and keep a good grip on everything and use a rear riser to steer. And then keep a good grip on this all the way to the to near the surface, 20 to 25 feet off the ground. You know, maybe five meters, six meters off the ground. And then let your hands free, grab your rear risers, rear riser flare. And now you've been able to prevent that downplane from driving you into the earth. So in this video, I'm going to actually use the, the, the technique of pulling both canopies to one side to try to recover from the downplane. So as you'll see here, I was slick. I'm on a 360 and a 375, so I'm pretty light, very light wing loading. Uh, but it only took me eight seconds and a total of 200 feet to get this thing to turn into a, a, a side by side. So here we go. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. And now I can land that. I can steer it and I can land it. All right, in this case, this video, we've got the side by side that is, uh, we're gonna turn it into a down plane and just get rid of it. The reason this video is on here is I had line twists on the canopy on the left. So I squeezed the risers together turned them and brought the twist into the riser so that I can reach above the riser to create left on left of the left and separate the canopies. So you can see I've already brought the twist down and here's the video starting now. Reaching above it on the left, right hand on the cutaway handle, separate, 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 cut away, let go. And you're good to go. So the last category in dual deployments would be partially deployed where we have a, a main parachute that's open and another container that's open and maybe a parachute that's out or maybe just a pilot chute that's out. So let's start with the simplest one first. I've got a main parachute that's open, my reserve container is open, and my reserve pilot chute and bridle are out, but the reserve is still in the canopy in the container. So with just that bridle out there, it's about three inches wide, it's usually white, and it's about 13 feet long. So if I see this, I have two options. I can either prevent the reserve from deploying and by, by pulling it in, or I could cut away the main and continue the reserve deployment. I would prefer, if I like the main, to just stick with the main and prevent the reserve from coming out. Because I don't know exactly what it did out there, and I'm going to have to do an inspection if I'm going to actually try to use it. So in this case, what I would recommend is you take your right or left hand, reach back, grab the bridle, bring it to the front, and hold it. That's all you have to do to prevent that re reserve from deploying. Now, I still have to steer my main, so I have the option to use my harness and harness turn, or take my free hand and do a riser turn, turning with the other hand. Whatever I do, don't let go of the bridle. Don't tie it off on anything, and don't try to pull the pilot chute in. Just leave it out there. Hold on to it. You could steer with just rear risers, or you could put two toggles in one hand. That would be another option. I would prefer to just steer with rear risers and hold on to that bridle. Fly your entire landing pattern down to your final approach, and when you're 25 feet off the ground, throw the bridle away, grab the rear risers, rear riser flare, and PLF. And that way you've prevented that reserve from deploying. And you notice that I threw it away at 25 feet. Once I throw it away, even if it starts coming out at that point, it's not going to affect my end. You're good to go. In this video, you can see that this jumper probably is aware 
that his reserve pilot chute is out. You can see that the 13 foot long bridle is out. You can see how big and wide it is, and it's white. And you can see that I think the jumper knows this because his brakes are still set. He's going slow. If he had released the brakes, it would probably pull the reserve out. But the fact that the brakes are still set, he hasn't collapsed his slider. Both of those tell me that he probably knows something's going on here, but he's not quite sure what to do. So let's hit play. And as you can see here, the cameraman's kind of giving us a little bit better angle of what he's got going on. And I would say that at this point, if you look back, you can see all you got to do is reach back there with your right or your left hand, grab a hold of that bridle, and hold on to it. If you hold on to that bridle, that reserve is not going to come out. And you are going to prevent that deployment for the rest of the time. And as you can see here, it's pretty obvious right here in the video that, that you can see the length of that bridle. And then it's right back there. You can reach back there and grab it. It wouldn't be difficult. Let's say I'm holding on to the bridle and all of a sudden the bagged reserve falls out of the container. No big deal. As long as you're holding that bridle, the locking stoves are on the bottom of the bag. So you're holding it by the, by the bridle, the locking stoves aren't going to come open. So if it falls out, all you got to do is pick it up by the bridle and then hold the bag. Hold on to it like your life depends on it. Because yeah, it does. At this point, I want to make sure that leave the bridle back there, leave the pilot chute alone. Don't try to bring the pilot chute in, just secure the bag. Don't stuff it behind your, behind your chest strap, don't try to put it in your jumpsuit, and don't try to hold it between your legs. Hold on to it with your arms and hold on to it very, very securely. Again, I would make sure I have a good grip and then I would work the rear risers to make turns and fly my landing pattern. Once I'm 25 feet off the ground on final approach, throw the bag away, grab the rear risers, rear riser flare, PLF. And that way you have prevented that reserve from deploying. And at 25 feet, it won't, it won't do anything for your landing unless it grabs a bush or something. That's about it. On this video, I actually have a sky hook. So for everyone wondering what to do about the sky hook or what does it change, it does change a few things. So first of all, I'm going to preface it. I'm going to let you know, I'm going to pull the reserve. The pilot chute's going to come out, but it's only going to come out about six feet because then it's going to be held by the sky hook red lanyard. So on this video, I'm going to try to unhook the, the red lanyard to see if I can get it to come off, and I couldn't. So then I went to the next step. I went ahead and knocked the reserve out of the container, and then I'm going to pick it up by the bridle. Now on this video, I'm being a lot more aggressive with it than I would have been if I hadn't been wearing that third parachute. So I hit play. You'll see as soon as I pull the reserve, it only comes out about six feet. So the sky hook, the red lanyard's going to hold it. So the first thing I did was try to see if I could unhook the, the red lanyard, and I was unable to. So the next thing I did is I went ahead and knocked the reserve out right here. You'll see it fall down. There it is. And you can see you've got the bridle and the suspension lines. Well, the bridle is holding it right side up. So this, the suspension lines, the locking stoves are on the bottom and there's no tension on them. So you can see I'm picking it up by the bridle and I'm moving it around a lot more than I would if I was, wasn't wearing that ter tertiary of a canopy. So be very careful with it, but just lift it up by the bridle and hold on to it. And you can see I've already brought it all the way up here. Now I did try to unhook the skyhook again and I still couldn't. So at this point, just hold on to it, leave the pilot chute back there, and don't let go of the bag. All right, so for this category, we've got the main parachutes open and the reserve parachute is hanging down below. Still in the bag, but with all the suspension lines out except for the locking stoves. Again, we could cut away and, and continue the deployment of the reserve or we could try to prevent it. And one thing you can do is you can scoop up all the suspension lines and then neatly pick them up and coil them and gently pick the bag up. If you jerk the bag, you're going to pop the locking stoves and the reserve's going to come out. But people have actually pulled the bag all the way up by the lines. So neatly bring it up and if you get the bag in hand, hold on to it. Leave the pilot chute back there. Don't try to mess with that. Just hold the bag and steer your canopy home. Again, 25 feet off the ground, throw it away, grab the rear risers, rear riser flare, and PLF. So in that situation, you prevented it, um, even though it was all the lines were out. If the locking stoves have it come open, you could bring it up. Now, what if I'm bringing it up and the locking stoves pop off? 
The bag comes off before I get it to my foot. If it's still somewhere underneath you, it's probably going to try to inflate. So at this point, you want to neatly uncoil all those lines, get them away from you, away from any equipment you have, and get that reserve away from you and get it to open. If it doesn't open right away, grab a rear riser on the other canopy and turn away from it. Make it open as soon as possible. We don't want to drag this thing around until we're on final approach and let it inflate at that point. If it's out of that bag, let's get it open and get it into a configuration as soon as we can. That way we can deal with it and we have a little bit of time and altitude to deal with it. Reserve static lines. Most dual deployments have no concern for the reserve static line. However, there are a couple of manufacturers out there that say, hey, for a dual deployment, you should disconnect RSL before going through any other emergency procedures. Um, I don't like to have to do that. I, I think that that's kind of an extra step that most jumpers wouldn't like to have to follow. Um, however, um, most rigs, it's not a problem. There are two different systems out there, RSL systems, that it could be a problem. And let's go ahead and identify those. One is the double guide ring RSL that you can find on a lot of older javelins and some other manufacturers as well. Or the other one is the two-sided RSL that you can find on only one U.S. manufacturer that I know of, and I don't know of any others in the world. So we'll talk about each of these and what is the dangers of those in a dual deployment. All right, so the first one is that double guide ring. So the RSL ring is between the two guide rings, as I'll show you here in the picture. Um, and when that RSL, when you cut away, that riser leaves and that center ring pulls the cable, which extracts the pin. It goes through the one guide ring, through the RSL ring, and it falls back down. At that point, once that RSL has been pulled, the reserve's on its way out. Well, in a dual deployment, the reserve has already come out, so the RSL doesn't have a job anymore. Um, so there's a really strange thing that can happen with the, the double guide ring. It's extremely rare, but I do know of two cases where it did happen. Um, and that's what you can see here in this next video. All right, so here in this photo, it shows the double guide ring, and it shows the RSL ring loaded, lo located between them. When you cut away and the riser leaves, you can see it bends the cable there, extracts the pin, then the, the pin then goes through the guide ring, through the RSL ring, and then it falls back down on top of the flat. And so that, that's what it would normally do, right? Well, when the RSL or when the reserve has already been deployed, it's possible that the reserve ripcord cable has already been moved for some reason. And you could end up with that, where you have the pin lodged between the guide rings and the RSL ring in between them. Um, I know of two jumpers that this happened to, so it's extremely rare. One was a rigger and he knew what was going on because he had already cut away the main, yet he's flying along and the main's still following him. And he saw that it was the RSL was holding it. So I don't know how he knew this, but he reached down, stroked the reserve, and released the main. I would have never thought of that. So he was pretty on it. So I know of another gal that had the same thing happen. She didn't know why the, why the RSL was still holding on. She ended up landing safely. She had a hard landing, but she wasn't hurt. So this is a possibility. And the only other rig that I know of that has this would be for the military. And that would be the RA-1 Raider Intruder System that has the two guide rings. So that's the only other one that I know of besides the older Javelins. The newer Javelins, they've changed that and you don't see that anymore. All right, so the other RSL that has an impact on a dual deployment is the two-sided RSL. Where you have the RSL hooked up to the right riser and the left riser. And as you can see in the picture here, as, the, as that riser... As, a, as you cut away, those risers leave, and there's a break in the reserve ripcord housing. And that's where it pulls the cable through right there, as you can see in the picture here. So whenever that happens, that's okay. The only thing is, what if the reserve opens first, and then the main opens second? Now that RSL is actually going around the reserve parachute. And so for that reason, this is kind of a tricky design. And they say for a, uh, for a dual deployment, before you get rid of the main, you need to disconnect RSL in this situation. So if you don't disconnect RSL, as you're going to see in this next video, 
you'll have the situation where this jumper who was on a wingsuit had a pilot shoot and tow. He cuts away, pulls his reserve, reserve opens, but then the main, because he has the reserve open first, the main comes out and the RSL goes around the reserve and closes it 100%. All right, so here you go. Here's the video. So you can see he's uh, moving suiting, pilot shoot and tow. He throws it out, nothing happens. So he cuts away, pulls the reserve, reserve opens beautifully. But now that RSL that goes all the way around is going to close off the reserve. And this is exactly what happens with this system if you don't disconnect the RSL. So it's going to slide all the way up. And now he's going to land under his main parachute. Once this occurs, you have absolutely no control of the situation. So this jumper is going to have to actually just hang on and go for the ride. He gets pretty lucky here because the main risers are fairly even. If the ri main risers get like this, the way the RSL is snagged on the reserve, then they're going to spiral in and can be killed, which I actually saw that happen to a person. If the risers are fairly even, like what he has here, well then the turn is slow enough that you're just going to have to deal with wherever you land. This guy, this is out at Paris Valley, out in California, and he obviously has a pretty good landing here. He has a pretty open area to land in. Um, it's kind of funny here, he's wearing a wingsuit, and so he goes to unzip his legs, because he's thinking, I'm going to get ready for a PLF, but then he thinks, wait a minute, that's drag. So then he sticks his legs out, sticks his arms out, and if I was him, I'd be going... I'd be doing everything I can to try to create as much drag as possible. So he does a pretty good job at that. And as you can see with this video, he's coming down fairly slow. He's got a pretty good size main. It's fairly even. It's in a pretty slow turn. And uh, he's just going to take the landing in this, uh, this nice grassy field that he landed in. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty good hit, but he got up, walked away without any injury. Um, however, other people haven't been as lucky. Let's talk about hook knives. A single line snagged on you somewhere, which is causing the canopies to do crazy stuff, that would be a great use for a hook knife. One of the things you got to be careful about with a hook knife though, a hook knife is a precision instrument. Use it with precision. Never slash at anything. You always pluck, pluck. Anything under tension, it's going to cut like butter. Anything not under tension, you have to create tension to cut it. So be careful with the knife. Don't just start hacking at stuff. People have actually hacked lines off of their reserve and been killed because they got a little too happy with the knife. So it's a precision instrument. Use it with precision. All right, so that's pretty much the presentation for dual deployment. So I've got a couple questions for you just to remind you for the very end here. Question one, if both canopies are deployed above a thousand feet, what two tasks must a jumper perform prior to cutting away that main parachute. Alright, so the answer would be check for entanglement. Make sure you're 100% certain that they're not entangled in any way. Separate the canopies using left on left of the left or left on left of the rear, depending on the side by side or if it's a biplane. Um, once they're separated, then cut away and let go of everything. Whatever you're holding in that left hand, remember, we're not choosing main or reserve. We're just choosing canopy on the left. So it might be the canopy you're cutting away, in which you need to let go because it'll rip your shoulder apart, or it might be the reserve, in which you need to let go so you don't keep turning all the way around and running into the canopy you just got rid of. If the canopies are entangled, the jumper's not sure if they're entangled, or you find yourself below a thousand feet AGL, what should you do? All right, the answer would be bring those canopies together using the rear risers with the brakes set or using the toggles of the one that you're holding half brakes to get the canopies touching overhead. Remember, keep them touching. Do not let them separate and downplane. If we are having them in a side-by-side -side or a biplane, remember, we can steer this. Steer by gently pushing one canopy towards the other one in the side-by-side -side, or steering the front canopy and the rear canopy will follow using those rear risers to control that front parachute. Because of all these are unusual situations, they require you being unusual in your response. 
and being creative in some situations. This next video I'm going to show you, I, I found it on the internet off uh, Friday Freakout, but it's one of the most incredible saves of a jumper I've ever seen. This is a jumper that never gives up, and he does a great job. So as you can see here, he just jumped out of that 182. He uh, just deployed, he's doing a hop and pop, deploys his main, has a spinning malfunction. Right away, cuts away, pulls his reserve, but the main doesn't leave. And what happens next is incredible. Let's go ahead and watch the video. So here he goes, he starts spinning, spinning. All right, I can't control that, cut away, reserve. And when he looks up, the main's still there. So now the reserve and the main are spinning together. Go ahead and get rid of those handles, bro. You need to get rid of them and get busy. He's got a lot of work to do now. So when he looks up right here on this video, what he sees, that's 90 miles per hour into the earth. That's 100% fatal. But this kid says not today. And he's going so fast with, with his free fall speed, he takes his leg and untwists the canopies. He spins himself. Look how fast he gets his body going here. He starts spinning his body so fast that he untangles the two canopies and then this. Ta-da! Oh my gosh, I can't believe he did that. All right, so here's that thing. Here's a good job for a hook knife. Take the knife and pluck. Get rid of that. And then get busy steering that reserve. So you see how he's got that twist, right? Turn the twist, reach above the risers, grab the lines, and start steering left, buddy. Come on, man, steer left, steer left. Don't mess with the main. You can't mess with that no more. You need to steer left. Go for the grass. Go for the grass, buddy. Quit messing with the main. Go for the grass. Go for the grass. Come on, you can make it. You can make it. Uh-oh. Whack. That's going to leave a mark. Um, however, go to the next video here and check this out. That kid gets up. He is going to be purple down one side of his body, but he got up. So here comes his buzz. Hey man, give me a hug. Let's hug it out. We gotta hug it out, man. And he deserves a hug. If anybody deserves a hug, that man deserves a hug. So what he ended up having is he had a bad packing technique. When they put the main parachute into the container, you can see how one line of the main got snagged on the closing loop. So when he threw that main out, one of those lines was tied to his back. So that's the reason it was spinning. That's also the reason when he pulled the cutaway handle, it didn't go anywhere because it was tied to him the whole, the whole time. Um, but the fact that this, you know, just be careful how you put your, your main into your main container and look where your lines are. Don't just throw them in there willy nilly. Be careful about it. You know, make it like your life depends on it because it, in a situation like that, it could. So these are unusual situations. They call for unusual responses. And that was one of the most creative responses I've ever seen. So good on him for saving his own life and never, ever giving up. All right, so in closing, uh, a dual deployment is an unusual canopy emergency procedure. So do what you can. Try to study this. Learn as much as you can from it. Um, remember that every no two situations are identical. There are always going to be slight differences. But these are the basics for how to deal with these, with these situations. Um, if you have any questions about this, you can reach me at that email address below or at that phone number. Um, also, if you have videos of things that have happened either in this, dual, in this dual deployment world, I would love to see them. I'd like to put them online and talk about them and make a, make a, a, a reference to them so that we can discuss it. Obviously, everything we talked about, like I said in the beginning here, had to do with fairly light wing loadings. We're not talking about Valkyrie 79s with PD-113 reserves. Everything we talked about still works, but way more twitchier, and the landing that you may end up with may not be one that you walk away from. You may end up hurt. Might be survivable, but you may still get hurt. So with the little tiny canopies, there are a few things that get a little different, um, but if we'd like to discuss that, I'd like to put that out there for everybody.